Great. Well, thank you very much, Alaria, and a very warm welcome to everybody. And thank you very much for joining us today. So my name is Chris Barton. I'm Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner to Europe. And my job is to encourage trade and investment between the UK and European nations. And I'm delighted to do so, as I believe and government believes that trade and investment really drives economic growth, it creates jobs, it improves living standards. So a genuine thank you to you for your interest, because your export success is key to the country's economic success. And as I'll explain in a moment, uh, there's no better place to achieve that success than in Europe, and there's no better time to do so than uh, now. So what I want to do is cover briefly three things in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. The first is to say why I think this is an excellent time to be looking to trade and invest with Europe, uh, then to touch on how we can help you do so, and then thirdly, briefly say what we can expect from the rest of today and Europe Trade Month. And then, uh, as Alari has said, you'll be hearing from, from our ambassadors from Sweden, Poland, Spain and Ireland and some practical details on our export uh, support service and a case study. So let me start. Why Europe and why now? And I want to start by acknowledging some challenges. Uh, to state the obvious, our relationship with Europe has been going through considerable transition over the last years, most directly with EU states, but also more broadly, including with Norway and Switzerland and others. And also to state the obvious, there have been some challenges in this transition. We've had challenges within the UK in identifying what relationship we want with the EU amidst uh, highly divergent and strongly held views. We've had challenges because leaving the customs union and single market inevitably means that there are now some additional frictions and complications in our trade. And we've had challenges uh, from the process of change, I'd say both at political level, relationships have been tested at commercial level, businesses have had to learn and adapt to new systems, and at personal level, a number have found the transition uh, difficult. So uh, there have been challenges, but I genuinely believe that on uh, those challenges, as well as of course with COVID, we now have really strong reasons to engage actively and enthusiastically in exporting to Europe. And let me share with you some of the reasons why. I say at first, because the Brexit deal gives us a really strong basis for trade with Europe. It's not the single market, it's not the customs union for the European Union, but it's at least as good as any other deal that the UK or the EU has with any other country outside the single market and customs union. It's, uh, we've replicated arrangements uh, with Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, uh, most of the Western Balkans and Israel, 99.97%. So almost all of our trade with Europe is covered by free trade agreements. And now we're improving some of those deals uh, with Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, with Switzerland, uh, with Israel. So a really good basis. Then Europe itself is a very largely stable and predictable trade and investment climate. It's got transparent regulation and a strong rule of law. It's on our doorstep. It's the easiest region in the world for us to export to. And that's shown that by trade flows, which are high. Nearly 280 billion pounds of UK exports were sold to the EU, to, to Europe last year. 870 billion inward FDI overall level of goods exports more than recovered from a dip we saw in January. Over half of UK trade is with Europe and eight out of 10 of our largest export markets are in Europe. And if you look to the future, the major opportunities in the near term for this to grow with huge economic stimulus packages across the continent further to COVID, not only the 750 billion euros COVID uh, recovery fund in the EU, but also the Western Balkans embarking on large infrastructure projects and opportunities in Israel, in Norway, in Switzerland as well. And then looking longer term, the highly compelling opportunities for growth too, uh, across a range of sectors. We've got the close proximity, rich and deep tapestry of shared commercial, political, economic and personal ties. So there are enormous opportunities for our trade uh, with Europe. We've got a stable basis to do it and the time to exploit them is now. So that's the opportunity which we're, we're keen to excite you about. How can we help you? Well, I'm very lucky to have a fantastic team of around 340 trade and investment experts spread around 34 countries 
across the continent. They're embedded in our embassies, who are headed by world-class ambassadors with deep experience and commitment to supporting our trade goals. And you're gonna be hearing from some of them shortly. From the northwest of Iceland to the southeast of Israel, from the northeast of Finland to the southwest of Portugal, across the EU, Norway, Switzerland, Western Balkans and more, we are here to help you. We've got people with deep market expertise. Most of our teams are hired in country, meaning they have the cultural, linguistic and personal backgrounds to give genuinely expert in market advice. And then we've got people with deep sectoral expertise covering priority areas such as clean growth, tech, infrastructure, food and drink, financial and professional services, retail and e-commerce, advanced manufacturing, defense security, health and life sciences. We've got people with deep regional expertise. We've got a well-established regional trade hub based in Prague, giving an access point for inquiries and a source of information if you want contacts for export growth at regional level. And uh, this is a great first contact point for companies. And we've recently launched a new Europe Market Access Centre as part of our export support service, which provides a hub of advice and expertise on potential barriers to export and how to overcome them. And that's supported by a regional network of uh, market access specialists. And then across the UK, we supported by colleagues uh, providing training, such as through the Export Academy, Export Finance, which uh, provides literally billions of pounds of export finance uh, to UK exporters and uh, trade advisors across the UK. So the message to take from all this is that with colleagues in London and across the UK, we can help you understand, navigate and overcome barriers to exporting. We can support you in identifying and exploiting export growth opportunities and we can champion free and fair trading policies with European governments. Uh, and we can also help source European investment into the UK. So across all these areas, we'll analyse opportunities and challenges, advocate UK exports and interests, and assist UK business with advice and connection. So please use us. We're here for you to help you in your trading uh, journey. So now is a great time to start or grow your exports to Europe. We're here to help. Let me turn lastly and briefly to how we're seeking to do so through Europe Trade Month. So Europe Trade Month is an important series of events we're running throughout November to excite and equip you to develop business in Europe. We're laying on over 20 events covering business opportunities around the region. Some of those are country specific, for example, for France and Ireland. Some of them are regional, for example, for Benelux, German speaking markets of Germany, Austria and Switzerland, Southern Europe, Central Europe and the Western Balkans, the Nordics and Baltics. And then we're doing some sector specific sessions, including for food and drink in Western Europe and an overview of our flagship tech export campaign. So whether you want to look at this from a geographic or a sectoral basis, we're going to be laying on uh, events for you. The sessions will give an overview of the opportunities on offer, advice on how to exploit them, and then details of the support we can provide you uh, through the various initiatives I refer to. And they're specifically designed to excite you about what's possible in Europe, help businesses like yours succeed in Europe, and then reassure you on the support available. So let me conclude with three requests, if I may. Uh, the first is please get excited about the opportunities for you to export to Europe. They are huge and varied and compelling. Uh, secondly, please use the services that we offer to help you to do so. We've got a range of different uh, uh, people and facilities and expertise, which you'll be hearing more about. We are here to help you, so please use us. And then thirdly, please sign up to our events over Europe Trade Month to hear more about all of those aspects. So look, I really hope that you find today compelling. I find, hope you find the rest of this month uh, helpful and supportive. And what better way to start now on all these things than to hear from some of our top ambassadors, which will do so now. So I'll hand back to Alaria and I hope you all enjoy the day. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. I feel very energized by your introduction. So that is always a good start. Um, so thank you for your uh, wise words and for your call to action, which I'll make sure uh, people follow through with. Now, 
you, as you've mentioned, we uh, are uh, proceeding to our second uh, session uh, of today. Um, those of you, uh, those participants that actually joined us early or on time will have uh, heard me behind the scenes um, uh, coordinating uh, our, our very special guests. I, we have four uh, UK, British ambassadors from across the continent here to talk to you today uh, and to reveal all their deepest, darkest secrets about um, how best to um, uh, enter their markets and to make to to exploit, if you like, the opportunities that abound. So it is with tremendous pleasure that um, I introduce uh, our distinguished panel of four British ambassadors. May I ask you, please, to virtually come to the stage. Um, I can see uh, ambas the, our ambassador to Sweden, Judith Goff, on my screen. Hello, Judith. Our ambassador to Spain, Hugh Elliott. Thank you. Um, our ambassador to Poland, Anna Kluns. And our ambassador to Ireland, Paul Johnston. May I ask you, please, in this order in which I've called out um, uh, to give us your three to four minutes, maximum five, I shall allow, uh, intro to your respective markets uh, so that we uh, uh, can hopefully um, uh, uh, commit or, or follow through on my initial uh, promise to uh, equip our participants with all the knowledge uh, that they need to uh, enter your respective markets. Over to you, Judith. Uh, thank you, Ilaria, and good morning, everybody. I'm not sure I'm going to reveal deepest and darkest secrets, um, but, I, but I will uh, let you all know that I did actually start my career in business um, as a management consultant and specialist in financial services. Uh, a number of ambassadors these days come uh, with a business background, and uh, that makes me very excited uh, about supporting uh, British business into European markets. Now, I'm talking to you today not just as uh, ambassador to Sweden, but also the director for our Nordic Baltic Network. Network, uh, which is a network of posts across eight countries, the Nordic and the Baltic countries. And I want to talk a little bit around uh, that as a market, uh, because, of course, when we talk about the Nordic and the Baltic countries individually, uh, I think a lot of people see them as very, very small markets. And indeed, uh, comparatively, they are. If you take Sweden, it has 10.2 million consumers, uh, Estonia 1.3 million, and you go down to Iceland, which has 366,000. So a very small market indeed. But if you take these individual markets together uh, as a region, you are looking actually at the United Kingdom's seventh largest export market in the Nordic Baltic region. Uh, and just a couple more statistics, if I may, we export more goods and services to Europe North, uh, to the Nordic Baltic uh, region, than we do to India, Russia and Brazil combined. Uh, and we also export about the same amount of goods and services to this region as we do to China. Uh, now, of course, those other markets are growing, but actually these markets are too. Economic growth in this part of the world is very strong. And if I'm looking at Sweden uh, and the other uh, countries uh, in this region, particularly in the Nordic countries, uh, they have weathered uh, the pandemic uh, far better than a number of other economies. And growth here is quite strong, uh, as is consumer spending. And over the past year, uh, despite uh, the pandemic and despite the challenges that we have faced, um, our team across the network has helped 2,500 businesses uh, with uh, their um, needs uh, across this market. So there's a lot of activity here and a lot of potential. Where are those major opportunities? Well, as seen from here, they're in tech, high technology and security in particular. Uh, we are looking at some of the most, if not the most, digitalized economies in the world. Uh, that's a huge opportunity uh, for British companies uh, and a growing demand, particularly in cyber security, but also artificial intelligence and a massive growth in infrastructure, whether we're talking about the Femin Belt, uh, which links or will link uh, the south of Denmark with Germany, or Rail Baltica, which is going to be a large project, which is going to be at least worth uh, 3.7 billion euros and have huge opportunities for British companies uh, if they choose to bid. Add to that, the growth of cities, Helsinki, for example, is one of Europe's fastest growing cities. There's a lot of opportunity here. So I'm not going to use up my three or four minutes um, uh, with much more other than to just summarize and say 
why, why is an audit Baltic network uh, or region exciting? Well, it's a market which really is close to home. You don't get closer to the UK, other than perhaps uh, Paul Johnson's patch in Ireland, uh, than the Nordic Baltic region. Uh, and it has a number of access points. It is heavily Anglophile. Uh, this region speaks English. Uh, it's very cultural aligned. It's easy to do business with by any measure, by any standard. Doing business with this region is, is much easier than most other places. Uh, they're also early adopters of new technologies and new trends. Uh, we'll come on to this a little bit later, perhaps in the Q&A. But if you have new and innovative project products and ways of doing business, then this really is a very good reason to trial that. We see very, um, very strong exports from innovative British companies coming into new markets, particularly here uh, where the early adoption uh, is, is something that is supported. They're heavily into innovation, technology and sustainability. Uh, obviously, we have COP26 uh, happening at the moment. But if you look at this region, that really matters. And it's really important here. And as I've said, finally, uh, this is a, a market that continues to grow. So in short, plenty of opportunities for British businesses who want to export goods and services into this region. And we have a large team uh, ready to support you, as, as Chris has already said, who can support you, whether it be market access, with trade policy, uh, they stand ready. And um, there will be details, I think, shared at some point, won't there, Alari, as to how uh, those dialing into this call um, can contact our teams if you require any help and assistance. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Beautiful and beautifully succinct. Thank you so much, Judith. Over to you, Hugh. Thanks very much, Ilaria, and, and and thanks and fascinating actually, and lovely to join um, to see to see my colleagues, and great to be talking to all of you. Uh, and I, I, as, as, as Judith was talking, I thought this could this could easily easily degenerate into a competition, because it bring, it may bring out the worst in the ambassadorial um, uh, instincts, which is to try to sort of sell our patches more. So. I'm going to try my best to avoid doing that, but I'm sure I won't succeed because I'm going to start off saying to say, if you take the larger UK family, I think you'll find that with Gibraltar, Spain is closer to the UK even than the Nordic region. But I'll, I'll try not to go too far down that track. Um, so thinking about sort of just generally what what's um, what's distinctive or interesting or useful or attractive about Spain in terms of the market, there probably sort of maybe three main things I would say. The first is that there is a, a huge existing commercial relationship between the UK and Spain. I mean, I, I'm not going to sort of chuck loads of statistics out there. I mean, they're all available. But just to say that um, the, you know, the UK is Spain's largest um, overseas investment destination. Um, and the UK has been the largest or second largest investor in Spain um, for years and that at a global level and that creates a set of business links which create a default for the countries to slightly look to each other and particularly for the Spaniards to look to the UK. So it's a huge existing relationship and it's a country of 47 million people. That's the first point I wanted to flag. Second point I suppose is that Spain is going to be the largest recipient of European Union funding is going to have 140 billion euros in loans and grants of next generation EU funds coming in. That's mostly going to be going to, well, not exclusively, to um, the digital and tech and sustainability, but these are very, very broad concepts are certainly being interpreted in a very broad way as the Spanish government puts its plans in place um, for investment that is going to be promoting. And again, there are, there, are, there are lots of opportunities, I think, on the back of that. So big country, big exist, uh, existing relationship um, and, and a lot of money coming into Spain. You know, money is not a problem for Spain right at the moment. Actually, the, the challenge that the government's got is how to spend it sort of wisely and quickly enough. Um, and then the, another factor I would flag is that the this is a huge expat market. So, I mean, we have 18 million British tourists in a normal year coming to Spain just in a year. We've got 400,000 Brits living here. According to official stats, it's probably 100,000 more when everybody sort of managers to get registered. We probably have a million Brits with second homes, somewhere between half a million and a million Brits with second homes. And for many people on the call, I think that that very expat um, market offers a lot of opportunities um, because obviously um, 
they'll be looking to to the UK um, in all sorts in all sorts of ways. Just one um, couple of sort of curious uh, illustrations: um, the uh, that Spain is the second largest at a global level, second largest consumer of British gin. So you never quite know. There are all sorts of opportunities in all sorts of sectors. Food and drink is very big here. Um, and we reciprocate that by consuming more Rioja than any other country in the world. So we do our bit for that um, as well. I'll, I'll stop there, I think, Hilaria, just by saying huge market. Um, looks to the UK, lots of opportunities around um, because of those links through supply chains on the back of investments, um, lots of money coming in um, and a very, very significant um, British expat market, which is attractive to a large number of sectors. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Hugh. I, I, I do like a bit of competition. And so I, despite your best attempts, I thought it was a very good good pitch. Uh, Anna, over to you to, to beat that. No, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Ilaria. Um, so uh, I'm here, uh, as you can see, on behalf of my my day job, which is being an ambassador to Warsaw, to Poland, but also on behalf of the Central Europe Network, which includes um, nine countries across this region, uh, Austria, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia and Slovenia. Um, and I was going to say just a little bit at the beginning about sort of how we organise ourselves to support businesses here and then talk a bit about the region and sort of the opportunities here. Uh, which, which is where I get a bit more competitive, I guess. Um, so we all, uh, the, the trade agenda and supporting businesses is absolutely top priority for, for the whole of, uh, every ambassador would say it across the whole region. The way we try and organise ourselves in this region is to take is to be champions of a particular area, a particular sector, a particular campaign. Um, and as I think Judith was describing in the Nordic Baltic area, that helps us, I think, to support you um, in the in the access that you have across the whole of the region. And so, for example, I take on FDI into the UK um, and other ambassadors across the region lead in different areas, retail, healthcare and life sciences, defence and security, automotive um, services and uh, infrastructure, to give a few examples. Um, and I think that, you know, if there is one thing that I wanted to, to sort of land with colleagues on the line, it is that this is a region that is um, growing very fast um, and is a, is a real region of opportunity for you. Um, I, we, of course, are growing from a, a kind of a very substantial base of, of trade. I think it was 63.8 million in 2019 before the before the pandemic for the region as a whole. That had risen 65% since the beginning of the decade. Um, and I think that just to say a few things about this region um, along the lines that, that Hugh just did. I mean, first, it's hugely economically dynamic. Um, it is the region that is growing very fast within the European Union. Um, I'm back in Poland. Um, I was last here in the 90s, and I can absolutely see the difference in terms of the infrastructure, um, the s size and shape of the uh, of the consumer economy here. Um, and uh, you know that that is set to continue. Secondly, um, it's a region that is the recipient of kind of quite significant um, EU funding. So Austria is obviously not part of that, but the 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 the, the countries along the eastern flank. Um, are receiving huge amounts of EU funding, and that helps, I think, drive um, drive investment and drive uh, drive the opportunities here. Um, and it is a region that, although the um, the sort of health numbers are not great in this region, the economic uh, response to COVID has been uh, amongst the best. And so, you know, countries like Poland are going to be among the best in the world in terms of maintaining and growing economy after uh, after uh, as we sort of get used to to living with COVID. And if you look ahead, I think um, IMF predict 5% growth for the region in 2022. Most of the countries are now, you know, well into getting very back close to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and the kind of issues that I think are, are really significant here um, and the opportunities that really stand out 
Um, and some of them do flow from EU funding, but that's not the only the only reason for that. So first of all, infrastructure is uh, really massive investments in infrastructure development across the whole region. Um, there is a regional initiative called the Three Seas Initiative, which is really focused on um, on all kinds of infrastructure, digital um, and um, and communication in infrastructure across the region, where they realise they've got to to catch up. Um, defence and security is a very strong sector here. Um, these countries sit on the eastern flank of NATO um, and are therefore to somewhat a, on the front line and uh, a huge a huge uh, sector and interest for us. Healthcare and life sciences. Um, so there is transformation to be done. I think, you know, I mentioned sort of poorer COVID response, but I think that demonstrates how important it is for these regions to invest and improve uh, in that sector. Um, consumer and, and retail, um, you can really feel in the capital cities across the region that it is, you know, these feel like European capital cities and that rising income is, is driving that sector. Um, and finally, uh, clean growth and sustainability. I mean, that is that there is a huge transition that these countries need to make and that creates huge opportunities for our businesses. So, um, oh, and final final thing I wanted to say is that, of course, you know, it is an also a region, I, I mean, just to, alongside its economic growth, there are some political challenges here. Um, what I would say about that is, of course, as an embassy, we are across all of these issues, but I think um, I wouldn't let that put you off. And I think uh, it's a conversation we're very happy to have with you. When I talk to British businesses who are doing business here, um, you know, this is a serious part of the agenda, but the opportunities are absolutely huge and they are very successful in, in winning opportunities in the market here. Let me hand back. Brilliant, really fascinating and, and very important uh, reminder. Thank you, Anna. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Alaria. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It would be very sort of, tedious and childlike to indulge in statistical competition with my peers, so I'm very tempted to do that. Um, Ireland is, of course, in uh, population terms, a relatively small market, just 5 million people, but it is a huge um, export market for Britain. Uh, incredibly, Ireland is the third largest export market for the UK, with exports of almost £35 uh, billion pounds in 2020, which is 6% of total UK exports by Volume. Why is that? Well, obviously, as has been already remarked, it's physically very close to uh, the UK, historically, culturally very close, similar language, same language, similar legal system, very easy to do business in. It's a country that is growing quickly, I think projected to have 5.5% growth this year, 7% next year. It attracts massive foreign direct investment. It's uh, committed to a big national infrastructure plan, building back better from COVID. It's planning to spend 154 billion euros over the next 10 years, which if you think about it, for a country the size of the UK, would be like so two trillion uh, pounds or euros over the next 10 years. So there are major opportunities uh, for British business in a range of sectors. We think particularly for scaling UK companies who have competitive products or services, but also perhaps better established British companies seeking you know, an Anglophone base inside uh, the Eurozone. And in particular, if you're looking at areas where Ireland is planning to do a lot of investment and a lot of um, uh, acceleration over the next few years, they have a big challenge, uh, like many other countries, in terms of affordable housing and housing generally. So the construction industry is going to be very big. They want to do a lot to overhaul their public health care system. We've been doing events with them on digital health. They're very interested in the UK experience. They've set demanding, legally binding um, carbon emission reduction targets, very topical to be talking about this week. So there's a lot to be done in uh, sustainable agriculture, transition, renewable energy, um, big investment in public infrastructure, including in transport, national and rural connectivity, and then um, basically digitization uh, across their industry. So we think big opportunities and an excellent DIT team here very happy to work with you uh, to help crack the Irish market. Thanks, Laurie. Brilliant. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, by the way, I wanted to apologize because I I, I took the liberty of of calling you of using first name basis. It's 
more than anything because I think it's testament to the extreme accessibility that that you as um, representatives of UK government overseas bring. And that's one of the things that if, if I were to kind of try to summarize what I've taken away from what what you've all said is that you are uh, incredible ambassadors in 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 in. in in name, but also in in practice for UK business, and that's really important because um, to the participants on the line, I think HMG or government often seems to be a black box. And part of the aim of today's session is to uh, demonstrate the opposite. And if we're talking about myth busting, I think another thing that uh, I hope we have uh, or you ha have done through your introductions is to uh, demonstrate what a growth region Europe actually is and to um, and what a dynamic market we have on our hands. And um, if you're looking elsewhere, think again. Um, the other thing that I've taken away is that um, we work as a region very much, um, I think, Anna and Judith have mentioned how they are part of a network or they lead their respective networks in the north and in Central and Eastern Europe. And so we we very much uh, collaborate and we share um, company uh, intel uh, within the context of GDPR. But, but if you have a need in one market, we are very much able to to uh, put you in touch with different bits of the continent to enable you to really reap the benefits of, of opportunities across the region. Um, as you also heard, many of our ambassadors have a business background and uh, therefore they are very much able to, um, to translate the politics that they are uh, a full part of in their host country uh, for a business um, and to turn that into success. So um, I hope you, you found that useful as a as a taster if you like now let's quiz quiz them a little bit further though um let me start maybe with judith and paul judith can you tell us please which uk export success story in your market you are most proud of and why um, i'm going to give you two for the first one i mean thank you Ilaria. I, I have a prop and i hope you can see it. It, it, it can i just stress this is not an open bottle of wine this is a closed bottle of wine i don't want people to think i'm conforming to stereotypes uh, but what this is is a flat bottle of wine uh, produced by a uk company called garçon wines uh, and we've been supporting them over the past two years with importer contacts uh, and also uh, navigating uh, the Swedish alcohol monopolies tendering process. Now, these bottles, um, I think, illustrate the point about these markets very, very well. Uh, they're sustainable. They're 87 percent lighter than glass bottles. They're made of plastic, which saves 500 grams of CO2 in each bottle for packaging, production and transport. They're 40 percent spatially efficient, so you can stack them up. Uh, and that means that you save 60 percent of CO2 emissions uh, in logistics. Uh, and with our support, these bottles have now launched across the Nordic market markets, and um, they are exceeding expectations in sales by 60%. So I'm really proud of this export win because actually it's an innovative British product. It's doing its bit for the environment, uh, and it really does illustrate how in these markets uh, there is a premium place on sustainability, innovative solutions, and how they move uh, towards early adoption of things that are different. And I have to say, uh, the fridge looks a little odd with stacks of bottles um, all piled up upon each other like that. That's not my fridge, by the way. That, that's somebody else's. Um, but actually, it's a very innovative and good product. And at the other end of the scale, I think we're particularly pre pleased uh, about how we have been able to support British businesses at landing contracts worth £68 million so far in the Femen Belt. Uh, this is a tunnel which connects the southern part of Denmark uh, with Germany. Uh, it will be finished in 2028. Uh, with our support, uh, we have won significant tenders for the UK, for UK companies, uh, and we have more coming up as well. So uh, two ends of the spectrum, both in terms of big infrastructure, but also in terms of innovative uh, products. Super. That is fascinating. Uh, I have never seen that before, uh, and that's absolutely brilliant. Um, by the way, just for the avoidance of doubt, we are not here to promote uh, alcoholism, given that we've mentioned gin and Rioja and, and other wine, but our UK food um, and drink industry is very important. And so uh, hopefully uh, around lunchtime, we are wetting your appetites. Um, Sorry, Judith. No, no, I was going to say it's always gin o'clock somewhere in, in the diplomatic network, Elaria. 
<laughs> Indeed. Um, Paul, same question to you. What are you most proud of? Well, I, I can't compete with Judith's visuals, except if I perhaps improvise one and, and stick a sort of computer mouse in the middle of the screen. One of, uh, one of our success stories for a small British company uh, was introducing a digital health company from Cornwall to bidding for a contract uh, in digital health in, the, uh, in one of the big Irish teaching hospitals, Cork University Hospital. And it's now on the radar of the Irish National Health Service more widely. And as I was mentioning earlier, one of the events we've been doing, one of the campaigns we've been having, has been sharing the experience of the UK NHS X and NHS Digital with the Irish Health Service. And there's a big 58 million euro Irish budget for digital health. And we hope that British companies like that Cornwall one will, um, will, will make their way into the market. At the other end of things, we've also been um, helping to introduce British companies to big construction and infrastructure opportunities in Ireland. Um, and uh, there are budgets totaling about 12 billion euros in some of the big projects to do with airport, port, rail, bus and, uh, and active travel. And uh, two big Irish construction companies looking for excellent British subcontractors. So we've got a number of deals uh, either signed or in the offing. So in both digital health, a sort of innovative sector and construction, perhaps a more traditional sector, we've been helping British companies, large and small, um, access opportunities in the market here. I haven't got anything for the construction visuals except um, I could probably extract a brick from somewhere, but I'll, I'll pause on that and give it back to you. Thanks, Alaria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as, as you can see from this panel, I think we are all quite um, informal and actually hopefully you'll, you'll find us honest. And so this leads me into my second question that um, Chris Barton, our trade commissioner, uh, alluded to in his introductory remarks, and that is 2020 and 2021, we recognize saw an extended period of disruption for UK exporters. And so I was wondering if um, perhaps Hugh and Anna in turn could talk us through what some of these challenges are as seen from your perspectives and what might be the opportunities uh, to recover from these challenges. Over to you. Sure, I'm happy to uh, kick off Hilaria. Just a couple of things that the conversations made me uh, just reflect on before I answer the question specifically um, is that just to stress for, for folks on the call that I, I hope what, we, what we're showing is that this is this is a core part of what we do with our jobs. I mean, as Judith said, we've got lots of us who've got business background. I spent sort of seven years in business in the middle of my career. Um, the it, it is not an add on in any way, shape or form. So we we and we spend an, an awful lot of our time um, working with business. It's not that we um, and I, and I that, that it's just we have teams. We've got brilliant teams, as Chris and others have been saying. Um, but it's also absolutely core to what we're doing and there's nothing sort of strange for us in terms of uh, in, in any way, shape or form in terms of working with exporters. It's our core job and that's what we want to try to try to do. And in a sense that, that, that the competition element perhaps draws that out. You know, we see this as something we want to you know. We really want to to, to help you to succeed. I mean, on now you're right, uh, Ilari, it's not been totally straightforward, has it? The the I think that what I would say that probably the main challenge that we have had this year has been through the Brexit process and the introduction of new export controls. If there's been a generic problem across Europe, but specifically in Spain, the challenge you've got is that you have got a, an environment which is relatively bureaucratic, um, not in global terms, um, but in European terms, it is relatively bureaucratic and in part because there are 17 different Autonomous regions is a highly federal, um, um, a highly federal structure, which has meant with with new controls plus lots of different layers to those controls. We've spent a great deal of our time this year working to get information from exporters to talk to who are having problems to work out what the problem is, whether it's you know, uh, to do with not properly understanding processes or processes not being applied properly by the Spanish, and help work through those. Um, those challenges by working with the health authorities, for example, of you know key regions for UK um, exporters, or with the customs people, or with people at ports, whoever it might be. We have teams who've been working on that. So my message would be, if you start off and you've got uh, you, you're, you're, you're trying to um, uh, um, break into one of our markets, then we have teams who can help you sort out problems as well. 
Um, and the, the opportunity from that challenge, I would say, is that although you've got 17 different markets, you've also got 17 different regional governments who are keen to take advantage of um, investment and exports from overseas. So you've got, you've got people who will try to work with you to help um, solve that um, on the Spanish side too. And then the other opportunity probably um, is that, you know, as others have said, you know, the Spanish economy, like many, is bouncing back very strongly from COVID. Um, it took a huge hit, very dependent on tourism. You know, tourism is bouncing back. Um, growth is bouncing back, forecast to be 6 or 7% next year. Um, so whether it's tourism, whether it's construction, sustainable energy efficient buildings, I referred before to the next generation funds and go in more detail if anybody's interested about the specific sectors. But there's a, there's a, there is a lot of bounce back going on and a lot of opportunities through that. Super, thank you. Anna? Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think I was, I was just sort of reflecting. I mean, clearly the, 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 the two factors that have really affected the market and the, the trading relationship most significant, obviously COVID and um, the uh, exit and finalisation of the trade and cooperation agreement, the new rules that changed. I was sort of re re remembering um, the, the run up to Christmas at the end of last year at 2020 when France closed the border and we had huge numbers of Polish and Romanian haulage sector stuck uh, on the roads up to Dover um, as being one of those kind of moments that really sort of demonstrated quite how challenging how challenging this was for for businesses. Um, I suppose it's three quick things to say about um, about how it how uh, how that feels. I mean, first of all, as Hugh said, I mean we've we've spent a huge amount of time talking to British firms uh, exporting to this region um, and firms across this region about uh, the issues in in the UK. Um, and the message that I always give everyone I talk to is that our ministers are open to understanding what the problems are and trying to challenge and, and tackle any frictions that emerge. Um, and I think that when we um, when we can identify those challenges um, and problems, um, uh, you know that our that that is genuinely my experience that that people want to understand it and try and work out what to do about it. Um, and those uh, I think what we are hearing across the region as a whole is that on the whole that that um, that sort of that transition the frictional the frictional change of rules. Um, most large companies have now managed to make that transition. Smaller companies I think it's uh, realistically taking a little bit longer in some cases. Um, but again the teams are here to try and help companies through that process. Um, identify problems and, and share solutions where we can. And um, of course, we're very mindful that there are further rules co changes coming up in the new year, particularly around um, uh, food and drink uh, exports from this region into the United Kingdom. That will that may well have a, a knock on uh, to, to uh, British exporters as well. Uh, and again, um, all of that, I think we we are in very close contact with firms across the region to try and work that through um, and firms across the UK. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is, of course, we do have the trade and cooperation agreement. So another thing that I think we have been um, or finding that, um, uh, you know, we are we are needing to do is sort of try and understand um, as the rules change in in regions to try and understand the degree to, you know any problems in the application of the and and commitment to the trade and cooperation agreement and certainly here in Poland there have been a couple of cases where we have raised concerns with the Polish government about proposed rules that they were planning to or they were they were they were consulting on that we felt were not in line with the uh, trade and cooperation agreement and we have been successful in raising those concerns with government uh, here so um Again, we're very mindful about ensuring that the full opportunities that exist under this agreement are um, are delivered uh, for British firms. Um, and then to sort of turn turn to COVID, which in a way I think has been, you know, a, a much a much more in, intangible um, and difficult uh, challenge for many many businesses in practical practical ways. I mean, again, thinking about you know what businesses tell us that I think actually movement between the region has been you know the the the, the drying up of. Um, uh, of um, of business travel has been actually one of the one of the biggest challenges that that, that they have found. Um, but I think as we have got into systems where where tra travel across um, for, between the UK and the EU has got a lot easier, that has obviously eased uh, very significantly. Um, but again, to go back to to what Hugh said, I think here too there are sectors which are 
either rebounding very strongly or creating new opportunities. And I, I mentioned earlier that health, healthcare and life sciences was a priority for this region. That is certainly the case. Um, we have um, managed to uh, get some export wins, um, one in the area of influenza vaccine, uh, for example, to this region. Um, and there are a number of large UK pharma companies who, are, who have hubs um, in, in this region who find it a very good place um, uh, essentially to do research and development and develop new products. So um, the, the kind of the, 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 the it, this region is incredibly um, innovative. Um, it has, uh, you know, and it has very good um, data uh, and, and um, uh, ex expertise to be able to invest in some of these more technologically advanced um, areas. Thanks, Ilaria. Super, that's really interesting. Anna, and, and if you don't mind, I'll come to you again for the, for our third question. Um, but, but before we proceed, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm based in Paris and I remember very much the closure of the border over Christmas. I, I wish you hadn't reminded me, but um, no, jokes aside, I'm very conscious of some of the um, some of the challenges that our businesses have faced uh, due to COVID and other obstacles recently. So uh, we're very much here to help. And uh, to pick up on Hugh's earlier point about ambassadors, you, sorry, British ambassadors making business a core part of their um, remit. Um, once again, being based in France, one of the feedback that we often get from businesses here is that in terms of the way um, uh, the UK model overseas works, uh, it, it makes it, very obvious that ambassadors are very much uh, uh, at the disposal and open to business feedback and um, uh, very much welcome hearing from businesses about the obstacles that they're facing and leveraging all of the tools at the disposal of um, ambassadors, such as ministers, such as trade envoys, etc to really support businesses and to understand what are the market access barriers that might what, that we might be able to make a difference about and ones that we might just have to uh, be better at explaining and accepting. So uh, basically we are, we do our best to, to help and uh, our ambassadors are very much uh, uh, crucial to that endeavor. Um, but anyway, <laughs> apologies. I just thought I would interject quickly. Our third question is um, the following. Anna and Paul, if you don't mind, what are the key trends that UK exporters should be aware of in your market right now? You've touched on some of these, but anything else you'd like to flag? Oh, so embarrassing because I was about to say tech and then I couldn't get myself um, unmuted. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I suppose two things really that I think, you know, and I, I talked about some of the hot sectors earlier, so I won't repeat myself, but I, I think these are the two things that I wanted to just kind of highlight. One is tech. Um, you know, this this region has very educated, uh, very successful graduates um, in the tech sector. Uh, there is huge interest. I mean, there are now anecdotal stories, actually, of people in this region working for Silicon Valley remotely. Um, uh, you know, we can see how successful the region is. I have to say, sort of possibly partly because of salary levels, but it's a very, very competitive region from that uh, area. Um, you know, very strong uh, STEM graduates compared to other parts of, uh, of, of the world. Um, and I think that British firms have um, made huge, uh, taken huge advantage of that in different in different sectors. Um, and certainly, it's also the case that this region, um, we have a number of companies or growing number of companies from this region who are expanding by investing in the United Kingdom and gaining access to um, global markets that way. So, so tech was one sector that I wanted to highlight. Um, the other, the other, I think, is really around just a growing sort of growing consumer um, consumer trend. Um, so average incomes in part of this region, uh, Poland, Czech, Hungary, Slovenia, and Slovakia, are now equal to those in Portugal, above Greece. You know, the, the region is is trending upwards. Um, uh, 
particularly uh, and particularly in the sort of northern part of the region. And that means that there is a growing demand for consumer products. Um, our retail uh, sectors are being uh, more and more successful here. Um, I think I think we're, we're we're apparently the ninth largest Scotch whisky market. But I think that's probably a bit pathetic now. I hear that Hugh is number two. So um, but uh, but anyway, uh, you know, th that's only one example of the many the many opportunities here. So so let me leave you the tech tech and consumer. Super, Paul. Thanks very much. Well, tech here as well. Ireland's investing a lot in artificial intelligence, smart tech, robotics, advanced manufacturing, and data analytics, and like big opportunities for cutting edge British companies there. I think the green agenda, I touched on that earlier. Um, Ireland has just announced that it will it's introducing carbon budgets like ours, these legally binding emissions targets. It's committed to getting down to 51% uh, of uh, its emissions by 2030. It recognises it's got a long way to go in some areas, not least uh, agriculture. We did a big agriculture innovation workshop um, uh, just last week because I think there's opportunities for Britain there. And also in a way related to our sort of levelling up agenda, there's a perception that there needs to be more investment across the country, spreading wealth and opportunity outside just the Greater Dublin area, which is 30% of Ireland by population. So we've had this programme in the embassy called Joining the Dots about connecting different parts of Britain to different parts of Ireland. We're hoping to have a big trade mission from the northwest of England uh, early next year. So big opportunities there in terms of helping um, various parts of the country connect better, not with just with Dublin, but also with, uh, with the UK. So opportunities there in transport and infrastructure more generally. I'm off to Cork next week to do some of that. Um, so I think, you know, the, the broader levelling up agenda, the digital economy, and uh, the green agenda as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you both. And now for the final question, I suppose. Um, Judith and Hugh, would you agree that it, we've heard about tech, infrastructure, renewable energy? Does that resonate as uh, the hot sectors in your market right now, or do you have anything to add? Um, thank you, Laria. Um, I, it, it does resonate, um, and I think I would, I would actually hone in a little bit more on some of the specific sectors within that uh, for this part of the world. Uh, so, if I look at um, the country I'm sitting in, Sweden, um, I have not seen a coin or a note in the two years that I have been here. You do not see cash in this society, which poses a real problem when your child's tooth falls out and you need to find the tooth fairy solution pretty quickly. Um, but on a more serious note, um, what we have here is a society that is heavily digitalized, and it's not just banks providing uh, financial services, it's, it's individual companies, it's new technology, new payment services. And, and as a result, that is delivering a degree of vulnerability in societies uh, like Sweden, uh, where they're looking for solutions to protect um, their, their businesses. And just this summer, we had a large cyber attack across Sweden, which took out uh, the co-op. That doesn't sound too drastic until you realise that lots of remote communities um, couldn't access food uh, for a number of days because the payment systems of a large supermarket were taken out. And that was quite a serious uh, moment of inflection for my hosts. So there is a real opportunity for British companies who are engaged in cyber security uh, across these um, countries where they're looking at some quite interesting challenges as they become ever more reliant on, on digital technology and as your mobile phone becomes the key to literally everything from a doctor's appointment uh, to payments to getting on the bus to getting on the train and so on and so forth. I think also physical security is, is, is part of that and also I would flag up the digital education sector as well. Um, that is certainly a growth area that we see, uh, particularly for remote communities. Um, we have those ourselves in the UK, uh, but there is a real interest in how one provides digital education solutions. And I think the pandemic has actually uh, pushed that uh, need and desire uh, to the forefront. And I think we have a number of companies uh, that are really well placed. And I'm just going to come back full circle to the food and drink position, because, of course, it will sound like that we're obsessed with alcohol. Um, I have to say the big growth market in this part of the world is in alcohol-free drinks. 
um, uh, and UK uh, alcohol-free beers uh, and, and, and wines are a real growth sector here. So if the flat bottles can take alcohol and alcohol-free, um, that's really important because, again, we're seeing new trends in this part of the world in the retail sector, but particularly in food and drink, which I think we'll see come through in our own um, country as well. So lots of opportunity, um, as I've said. And following up uh, direct, I mean, echo a lot of what Judith has said. I mean, it's a bit invidious, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm sure sort of people people on this uh, on this call will be will have sort of specific interests in specific sectors, um, and 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 we're all talking about sort of big economies or groups of economies, and so pretty much anything, frankly, um, there are opportunities everywhere. I mean, just to, to, to cite one sort of small example, I mean a. Uh, uh, it happened that one of our sort of local heads of uh, of our of our commercial team in Barcelona was getting a COVID test done in Liverpool, and on the back of that conversation, well, long story short, but but there was 14 million um, pounds worth of um, uh, uh, of sales into Spain on the back of on the back of the of, of that conversation. There are opportunities in just just about everywhere when you're talking about economies as big as these. Um, and but but yes absolutely those are partly because of the next generation um aspects that i talked about so the tech side and the sustainability side i mean whether you're talking about fintech or health tech or ed tech or insure tech or or ai or 5g all these these are words which uh, resonate a lot um, as the spanish government is trying to design its new um uh, investment uh, and uh, industrial program and industrial um, strategy um, and also on the sustainability side, Spain is very big on solar. It's looking a lot at floating um, wind capacity. It's got 6,000 meters, kilometers of, of coastline, but it doesn't have a massive continental shelf. So that's a very interesting area for Spain. Energy storage comes with that, of course. And you know, one British company, for example, called Highview Power um, has uh, recently invested you know, not far off uh, a billion euros into Spain to try to, um, to, well, to take advantage of the market in its um, energy storage technology, which is based on, on as far as I can work it out, fascinating technology of cooling air down to liquid and then taking advantage of the regasification process when exposed um, to, uh, to ambient temperature to drive turbines. And it's a fascinating technology and just shows how much how many different aspects of the tech and sustainability market are actually offer opportunities across such a range of sectors? Brilliant, thank you, Hugh. And and may I take the opportunity actually to um, to highlight the fact that we have a number of specific tech sections um, in the third week of Europe Trade Month. So uh, I think you mentioned ed tech, fintech, etc. Um, so watch this space. For, and join us for those sessions um, if you're interested in more. Now, we're two minutes out of time. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say a huge thank you to our uh, ambassadors. I hope you found the session interesting um, and um, we, we could not do this without you. So thank you so, so much. And let us give you a virtual round of applause. Thank you.